The Territory of Michigan was established in 1805, and when the Erie Canal was completed in 1825, white settlers began coming to the area looking for a brighter future. The land was divided up into counties, and Clinton County was born. The first schoolhouse was built in 1840, and at the time it was common to have a bunch of small schoolhouses all over so that children didn't have to walk far to get to school. The land was divided further into townships, and in the spring of 1843, Bath Township was formed. Andrew Kehoe was upset that the community wasn't operating the way he wanted things to operate. He tried to make changes, but nobody in town seemed to agree with his ideas. Once he had nothing left to lose, he exacted his revenge on the entire town. This is Monsters. May 18, 1927 was the last day of school for students who attended the Bath Consolidated School in Bath Township, Michigan. The 15 seniors who attended the school were not in the building that day. They had taken their final exams the previous week and weren't due back to the school until the next day for their graduation ceremony. Despite that, there were still about 250 students at the school. Classes began at 8.30 a.m., and that day, there was an electrical issue that kept the electrical bells from ringing, so the principal rang a large gong in the main hallway to signal the start of class. Hidden in the basement of the school was an alarm clock that was ticking away. At exactly 8.45, the clock's alarm went off, triggering a stockpile of explosives that had been hidden inside the school. The entire north side of the building jumped off its foundation and then came crashing back down. The roof collapsed into the building, crushing anything underneath. Neighbors heard a loud boom, and some thought that the oil barrels at the train station might have exploded. But when they went outside, they saw half of the school missing. Everyone within earshot of the blast ran to the school to help. At the same time, other people were also looking at an explosion, but this one was not at the Bath School. This one happened at a nearby farm owned by a man named Andrew Kehoe. Andrew Kehoe was born on February 1, 1872, in Tecumseh, Michigan. He was one of 12 children born to Philip Kehoe and a number of wives. Philip first married a woman named Mary Mellon in 1858, who he had two daughters with before she died two and a half years later. In 1864, Philip married his second wife, Mary McGovern, and they had nine more children before she died in 1890. Philip was a successful stock breeder of cattle, sheep, and hogs, and it earned him a spot in a local magazine when they profiled area success stories. Andrew came along after Philip had six daughters, so he got special treatment from his father. Andrew also had a strong mechanical aptitude, and he would spend most of his time in the barn experimenting with electricity, something that was fairly new at the time. Other people said that he was a loner who preferred to stick to himself. Andrew was 18 years old when his mother died of what was said at the time was a disease of the nervous system. After high school, Andrew attended Michigan State University and took classes in electrical engineering. Sometime later, he moved to St. Louis and began working as an electrician in a city park. While there, he fell and sustained a head injury that's said to have resulted in him being semi-conscious for two months. Possibly some type of coma, but that's really just speculation. Eventually, he went back to his father's farm and lived there, helping with the livestock and continuing to experiment with electronics. By this time, Philip had married his third wife, Frances Wilder, and they had another daughter together. It seemed as though Andrew was not a fan of his new half-sister because it's said that he killed her cat. Then, on September 17, 1910, Frances went into the house to start making dinner, and when she lit their new gasoline stove, it exploded, lighting her on fire. Now, these stoves were already incredibly dangerous, but many people believe that Andrew had a hand in making the stove burst into flames. When Frances started screaming, Andrew ran into the kitchen and threw water onto her, but since it was an oil fire, it caused the fire to get worse. Eventually, he and his father were able to get the fire out and they put Francis in her bed. 
Then Andrew ran down the street to the only neighbor who had a telephone. That neighbor recalled Andrew opening the door and asking her to call the doctor. When she asked if someone was hurt, he nonchalantly replied, Fanny got burned. Then he said, oh, can you also call a priest? There was nothing that anyone could do to save Frances. Her skin was melted off and her flesh was charred to the bone. She died a few hours later. Due to the reputation of gasoline stoves bursting into flames, her death was ruled an accident. On May 14, 1912, at the age of 40, Andrew married a woman named Ellen Price, who went by Nellie. Nellie was a few years younger than Andrew, and it's said that they had met previously at Michigan State University. The couple lived at the Kehoe farm, and Andrew worked the land while Nellie acted as a surrogate mother to Philip and Francis's 10-year-old daughter. During the times while Andrew worked on his father's farm, he would regularly use dynamite and pyrotol to clear the land. In 1915, Philip died and Andrew, as the executor of his estate, remained on the farm for another two years until Nellie's uncle died and his 80-acre farm in Bath became available. They purchased the property for $12,000, putting $6,000 down and taking a mortgage on the other $6,000. Once in Bath, Andrew got things off on the right foot. Neighbors said he was always willing to do favors or come by and fix things that weren't working properly. It also helped that Nellie had grown up in Bath and many people still remembered her. They did notice that Andrew was quite unorthodox with his farming. While most farmers would be at work in coveralls, covered in dirt from fields or grease from the machinery, Andrew wore a business suit and dress shoes. Neighbors were called seeing him drive one of his shiny new tractors in a suit and tie, not a hair on his head out of place. If an article of clothes did get dirt on it, his neighbors said he would immediately go inside and change into clean clothes. Despite his odd dress while tending his farm, most people agreed that Andrew seemed to be a nice guy, but there were signs of his true nature. About a year after moving to Bath, Andrew shot a neighbor's dog because he didn't like its barking. The neighbor seemed to get over it, but his wife stopped associating with Andrew or Nellie. The first school in Bath was a one-room log cabin that taught kids of all ages in the same place. Eventually, the school burned down and a new one was built. It wasn't long before there were ten different smaller schoolhouses around the community, but people thought it might be better to build one large school where the children could be broken up by age and the lessons could be fine-tuned to those ages. Of course, the locals had questions. How would the kids get to school? Who would feed them? And of course... Who was going to pay for it? A state official came to town to explain the process on July 22, 1921, and after it was put to a vote, the referendum passed. Funding from the school would come from property taxes. They would move the largest of the current schoolhouses to a new central location and add on to that. Then they would set up a bus system to pick children up and take them to the school where they would be fed school lunch. They hired an administrator, a principal, and, of course, teachers. The school opened in the fall of 1922 with 236 students. After three years of operation, the school became accredited, which meant it would now be eligible for state and federal funding and grants. But people in the area were still upset about the raise in taxes. One of the most vocal of them was Andrew Kehoe. He decided to take action, and when the school board treasurer was up for re-election, Andrew ran against him and won the election. Once sworn in, Andrew demanded that the school superintendent, Emery Hewick, not attend school board meetings. Andrew felt that Emery was trying to have more control than he should. The school board told Andrew that he was actually required to be there in order to receive state funding. Andrew couldn't force the superintendent out of the meetings, but he told him he couldn't be involved. Emery could only sit there and listen. Then Andrew made Emery the focus of all of his disdain. When the superintendent requested a summer vacation, Andrew was the only one who voted no. Despite his contentious relationship with Emery, as treasurer, his books were always in perfect order. Because of that, he was appointed the position of township clerk when the current clerk passed away. He only finished out her term and had to run again for the position during the next election cycle, and he was only able to do that if he was nominated which he wasn't. Despite his fastidious bookkeeping skills, his confrontational nature caused the officials to nominate someone else. This was the first blow to Andrew that would send him down a path to revenge. 
In the summer of 1926, Nellie started developing health issues. She was having severe headaches followed by a nasty cough and rapid weight loss. She started going to the hospital where doctors first thought she might have tuberculosis, but then decided it was just asthma. After that, she became nearly bedridden. They hired a young woman to help out around the house since Nellie wasn't able to do much. Andrew's method of keeping books for the school board did not match his own finances at home. After purchasing the farm from Nellie's uncle's estate, he made a few payments and then completely stopped. He hadn't made a mortgage payment since March of 1921. The mortgage was set up directly between Andrew and the Price family using a lawyer, so where a bank would have taken the property back by now, the Price family gave him an extension. And then another one. And another one. He had lived on the property for nearly four years without making a payment. By the end of 1926, though, the lawyer was not willing to let the Kehoes live on the farm for free and he filed a notice of foreclosure. When the sheriff served the notice to Andrew, he claimed that the man said that he would have paid his mortgage if it hadn't been for the school taxes. He's already taking blame away from himself. With failures piling up around him, Andrew began planning a final act of retribution against the people he believed had ruined his life. In October of 1926, Andrew asked a neighbor to drive him to a nearby town to pick up some pyrotol. Pyrotol is a low-grade explosive that was made from surplus gunpowder left over from World War I. The manufacturer wanted to sell off its extra supplies and the Department of Agriculture wanted to help farmers prepare their land for crops. So the two came together and developed an inexpensive explosive for them to use. They could blast a stump or a large boulder in their field with pyrotol and make it easier to remove in smaller pieces. It was said that a 6-ounce stick of pyrotol was as powerful as an 8-ounce stick of dynamite for a fraction of the price. A farmer could clear an acre of tree stumps with dynamite, which would cost him $28.75, but could do the same thing with pyrotol for $7.28. Of course, before you start thinking it's crazy that people were able to cruise into the farm supplier and pick up a crate of pyrotol, they were also able to just pick up some dynamite as well. The 20s were a wild time. Andrew and his neighbor picked up 500 pounds of pyrotol and some blasting caps before heading back to the farm, where his neighbor figured he was going to do some land clearing. After dropping off Andrew and his pyrotol, the neighbor ran into some other locals who said they also had some stumps they needed to remove. And when they found out that Andrew had just purchased 10 boxes of the explosive, they tracked him down and asked if he had any to spare. Andrew told them that it was already all gone. 500 pounds of explosives were already gone? That seemed odd. In the four years since the Kehoes had moved to Bath, they never owned a vehicle. They relied on their neighbors to give them rides to places like the grocery store or to pick up 500 pounds of explosives. You know, normal daily errands. In November, Andrew purchased a flatbed pickup truck, which seemed like an understandable purchase at the time. Even though automobiles, which people at the time referred to as machines, were still not yet commonplace, having a machine for your farm was a useful resource. Once he had the truck, he drove to Lansing where he purchased two boxes of Hercules Dynamite plus blasting caps. Though his neighbors thought he bought the truck for the farm, it's believed the purchase was so he could pick up more explosives on his own. If he had asked his neighbor to take him to Lansing to pick up dynamite, he would have been suspicious why he needed that on top of 500 pounds of pyrotol. He would eventually make more trips to pick up more pyrotol and more dynamite. On December 31st, when the clock struck midnight, people in the quiet community raised their glasses and then were startled by a series of explosions. It was a minute where it sounded like the town was under attack and then everything fell silent. A few days later, some neighbors stopped by and asked Andrew about the explosions. Andrew explained that he wanted to ring in the new year with a literal bang, so he rigged some pyrotol to a cheap alarm clock set to go off at midnight. The neighbors thought it was an excessive way to celebrate, not knowing that Andrew had just found an excuse to test out a timer for his explosives. Throughout the new year, Nellie's health continued to get worse. She went back and forth between the farm and the hospital multiple times. Neighbors noticed that Andrew wasn't tending to the farm. The tractor sat idle and the field was overgrown. 
In the spring of 1927, Andrew was nominated for the position of County Justice of the Peace, but was defeated by a large margin. Though Andrew didn't show any anger at the loss, it just added to the overwhelming feeling that the people of Bath were against him. Cars in the 1920s still had to be hand-cranked to get them started. In Michigan, though, the cold weather made that a difficult task, so people started to hook a device to their engine called a hotshot battery. This would create a spark to ignite the engine. Now that Andrew owned a machine, it wasn't odd to see him purchase a few from the automotive supply store during the first week of May 1927. On May 14th, a construction crew working on a bridge reported a large supply of dynamite had been stolen from their work site. It's believed that it was taken by Andrew. People in Bath noticed that Andrew was acting strange, not tending his farm, trying to get neighbors to take his horses, and setting off explosives on New Year's Eve. But people also knew that Nellie wasn't doing well and thought that the stress was probably affecting Andrew. What they didn't know was that Andrew had been on a downward spiral mentally and he had been planning a final act of revenge for quite some time. During the previous summer break, the school board had Andrew do some electrical work in the school. He had access to every part of the school and was able to start planning out the exact details of his plan. During the end of 1926 into 1927, Andrew loaded a massive amount of explosives into the basement ceiling at the Bath School. He hid some of it in pipes and the rest behind plaster and wired it all together to use two hotshot batteries as a power source and an alarm clock as a timer. He also placed a container of gasoline and multiple sacks of gunpowder in the basement, possibly hoping it would help ignite the remains of the school on fire. Andrew didn't only see the Bath School as his enemy. He was angry at people who were trying to take his farm away from him. You know, the one he wasn't paying for. Andrew loaded explosives into his barn and his tractor so both would be destroyed. At the beginning of May of 1927, Nellie was back at the hospital and when she was released, she stayed at her sister Elizabeth's house for a couple of weeks. Andrew used this time to rig the house with explosives and then he set all three locations, the school, the barn, and the house, to go off at the same time. Andrew was supposed to pick Nellie up from Elizabeth's house in Lansing on Sunday, May 15th, but a storm came in that delayed their plans for another day. After Andrew returned home with Nellie on Monday the 16th, it's believed that he killed her sometime within the next 24 hours. The following evening, Elizabeth called to check on her sister, but Andrew said she was at a friend's house. That seemed strange seeing how sick she was, and Elizabeth asked when she would be back. Andrew told her he planned to pick her up on Thursday. Elizabeth was shocked by that response, but there was nothing she could do, so she accepted it. On the morning of May 18, 1927, lightning had crackled across the sky in the early morning hours, but it cleared up by the time people were going to work. Linemen were out early, climbing poles to string electrical wires along the road. Electricity was finally coming to the entire town meaning that the residents who did have electricity could turn off their generators and start using power on demand from the local power company. Underneath the bath school, along with hundreds of pounds of explosives, the well pump that provided water to the school wasn't working and the janitor was waiting for a repairman early that morning. Andrew had driven into town that morning to drop off a package for delivery and when he was walking back to his truck, he ran into a man named Albert Detloff the town blacksmith who was also helping with repairs on the school. Albert mentioned the problem with the well pump and asked Andrew if he would come by and take a look. Andrew agreed, but once they got to the school, he looked at his watch and said it was 8.25. School was about to begin, so they didn't have time. Albert looked at his own watch and corrected that it was only 7.25. They had over an hour. This was because Andrew kept his watch set at Eastern Time, which is the time zone that Michigan is in, but the school operated in Central Time. By the 1920s, time zones had been set up, but it was only the rail system that was strict about their use. People still seemed to be setting time zones however they wanted. This makes me wonder how Andrew got the alarm clock set for the correct time of the start of school since it seemed like he would have set it to go off an hour early. We'll probably never know. After Andrew and Albert met with the janitor in the basement, they began looking at the pump, but then Andrew snapped that he was in an awful hurry and he stormed out of the basement. As he got into his truck and drove away from the school, all of the children in the community were coming out of their houses and making their way to their classrooms. They socialized with other students until the principal rang the gong to signal the start of class and they all found their seats. 
ready to complete their final day at school before their summer break. Back at the farm, Andrew put Nellie's body into a wheelbarrow and placed it by a chicken coop near the barn. Then he went into the barn and tied his horses inside so they couldn't escape. Not only that, he used wire to tie their legs together so they wouldn't be able to get out of the barn even if they came untied. Then he started loading his truck with debris. He loaded nails, bolts, and any other metal scrap he could find that would act as shrapnel when his truck exploded. At 8.45 a.m., the alarm clock in the basement of the school created a spark that caused electricity to travel down a series of wires that connected to numerous blasting caps. The area around the school was rocked by a massive explosion. The north wing of the school was forced upward by about four feet before it came back down and fell apart like a house of cards. Then the roof came down on top of everything. The south wing shook violently and light fixtures fell to the floor, shattering. The force of the blast caused windows in neighboring houses to blow out. People responded to the explosion by coming out of their houses to see what happened, and once they saw the school, they raced toward it to help. Bodies were strewn everywhere, many were dead, more were dying, and the rest were injured. The home economics teacher had a splinter of wood impale her shoulder. Eight-year-old Cleo Clayton managed to jump out of the window and make it to safety in front of the school, at least for the time being. At the same time, while people near the school were processing the disaster unfolding in front of them, people near the Kehoe farm were doing the same thing. Andrew had set the timers attached to the explosives in the house and the barn to go off at the same time as the school. One of the linemen working on the electrical wires saw the house burst into flames. He and two other workers raced to the property, and since only part of the house was on fire, they went inside to look for survivors. They didn't find anyone inside, but they did find a pile of dynamite in the corner of the living room. Without even thinking, one of the electricians grabbed the dynamite and threw it out the window into the garden. Once the smoke was too thick, they all left the house and as they were getting into their car, the barn exploded, throwing the men to the ground. The linemen got in their car and took off, but neighbors began coming out trying to see if there was anything they could do to save the farm. But everything was on fire. The house and every building on the property were fully engulfed. As neighbors stood on the road and watched Andrew's house and barn burn, he suddenly pulled up in his truck. He yelled out of the driver's seat that they should go to the school and then drove off in that direction. More and more men and women arrived at the school to help with the rescue. They dug through rubble with their bare hands, searching every inch for anybody they could find, hoping whoever they did was alive. The rescuers could only do so much before they reached the roof, which was now on the first floor. Despite the number of people on site, it still wasn't enough to lift the heavy structure. The man who owned the town slaughterhouse jumped into his machine and headed to his shop to get some rope. They hoped that they could rig up something with the rope that would help them lift the roof off the floor so they could reach the victims trapped underneath. While the rest of the survivors made their way out of the damaged building, the school superintendent ran to the telephone office and told them to contact the police and firefighters in Lansing. They weren't able to lift the roof with the ropes, but another local suggested that they use a telephone pole to lift the roof like a lever. They drove down the street and hooked a telephone pole that hadn't been installed yet to the back of the car. They drug it to the school and lifted it in place so they could pry up the roof. Once they were able to raise the roof, it became a slow process of extracting each of the children from the wreckage. The dead were laid out on a grassy knoll in front of the school, while the injured were laid on blankets in another area where they awaited medical treatment. In the midst of the rescue, Andrew drove his truck right up to the front of the school. Emery Hewick approached the truck and stood right next to it talking to Andrew. Witnesses say they saw some sort of struggle between the two men, and then Andrew shot either a handgun or a rifle at the back of his truck, and the entire thing exploded. Both Andrew and Emery were immediately killed by the blast. Rescuers would later say that body parts were found in trees and yards hundreds of feet away. What was left of Andrew's body was found in a ditch down by the road. The shrapnel that Andrew put in the truck flew in every direction, killing more people, including Cleo Clayton. A large bolt tore through his stomach, and he died in the hospital seven hours later. Only minutes after Andrew set off his car bomb, dozens of firefighters arrived from Lansing. 
Then people from all around started showing up, including police, doctors, nurses, construction workers, members of the Red Cross, and even members of the 119th Division of the U.S. Army. They all got to work clearing the debris and treating the wounded. The fire captain went into the basement to survey damage and stumbled across a pile of pyrotol that had fallen from the ceiling under the south wing of the school. This was only a small fraction of what they would find still underneath the building. Following the wires that led from the pyrotol, the investigators found over 300 additional sticks of unexploded pyrotol, 10 burlap sacks of gunpowder, and 204 sticks of Hercules dynamite planted throughout the building between the ceiling of the basement and the first floor of the school. It was all connected by a network of wires to the hotshot batteries and a crude timing device fashioned from an alarm clock. For reasons nobody will know, the signal in the wire ignited the explosives under the north wing, but never made it to most of the explosives. It could have been due to faulty wiring, a short in the wires, or not enough power from the batteries. If Andrew's plan had worked, the entire school would have been completely destroyed, killing every student and teacher inside. It would have been the worst premeditated murder of children in the history of the world. Even though a much worse massacre didn't happen, Andrew Kehoe still killed 38 children and 5 adults at the school, plus his wife at the farm. Without including his suicide, he took 44 lives that day and injured 58 others. Unlike the school, all of the explosives at the farm detonated as planned. When authorities finally arrived on the scene, the house, the barn, and the tractor were all destroyed. Inside the burnt-out barn were the remains of the horses, with wire still tied around their legs. In the property's orchard, Andrew had cut around the base of the trees, which is called girdling. It's commonly done to control the growth of trees, but in this case it was intended to destroy the trees so they couldn't be used in the future. They also found that the grapevines had been cut off at the base but carefully placed back so they looked undamaged. Andrew didn't want to just harm people, he wanted to render useless anything that someone could salvage from the property. Attached to a fence on the perimeter of the property, authorities found a sign with Andrew's final message to the world. It read, Criminals are made, not born. This was Andrew's attempt at blaming other people for his actions. Because the town raised his taxes and didn't elect him as town clerk, they caused him to blow up the school and kill 44 innocent people. They made him do it. His hand was forced. Their decision to raise taxes gave him no other choice. Just like the taxes made him not able to pay his mortgage. Everything was somebody else's fault. He went to his grave refusing to accept the truth that he was simply a stubborn, self-centered cheapskate who couldn't handle not getting his way. It was two days of searching the farm property before authorities noticed a burnt-out wheelbarrow sitting by the chicken coop. When they inspected it, they found the remains of Nellie Kehoe. She was burnt down to the skeleton, and near her body was a metal box with a marriage certificate and hospital bills. Donations to fund the building of a new school came from all over. The Red Cross and other charities raised money. People sent in checks and businesses took up collections. Some of the inmates at Michigan's Ionia Prison raised $200 for the cause. That's how bad Andrew Kehoe was. Prison inmates, including murderers and rapists, thought he was a monster. They're like, whoa, hey, I know I shot a guy robbing him, but at least I didn't blow up a school full of children. The following school year, classes were held in a nearby community hall. The damaged portion of the school was cleared, and a new wing of the school was built there with donations from the community. While construction was happening, more explosives were found on three occasions. In 1975, the school was demolished and turned into a memorial park. They erected a monument to memorialize the victims. If you're the victim of domestic abuse, please reach out to someone for help. Talk to your local shelter or call the National Domestic Abuse Hotline at 1-800-799-SAFE. That's 1-800-799-7233. Or you can go to thehotline.org to chat with someone online. This website is set up so that at any time, hitting the escape key twice will take you to a Google search page. That way, if your abuser is nearby, you won't get caught seeking help. 
If you're having feelings of harming yourself or someone else, or even just need someone to talk to, please contact your local mental health facility, call 911, or call Mental Health America, who operate the National Suicide Prevention Hotline at 1-800-273-TALK. That's 1-800-273-8255. They're available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Thanks so much for letting me tell you this story. If you enjoyed it, subscribe on whatever platform you're on, hit like, rate us, or leave us a comment. You can also check out our other show, Somewhere Sinister, on YouTube or anywhere you listen to podcasts. If you'd like to support the show, check out our new merch at Teespring. The link is in the description. Thanks again, and be safe.